Well, hello and greetings from the Education Center at Harbor Branch. Uh, as you can see from the title slide, I uh, will be talking about two topics today, uh, earthquakes and tsunami. And just to make sure that we are all on the same page here, let me give you a very quick introduction to each of them. You're probably familiar with the term earthquake, but that uh, can be defined as a sometimes violent slipping of Earth's crustal plates. And I'll be talking about crustal plates later on. Tsunami uh, might be a little bit less familiar, uh, but tsunami are, are uh, large and certainly very long wavelength from crest to crest, very long wavelength ocean waves. The two can occur together, earthquakes can produce tsunami, but we will see that many and probably most earthquakes uh, do not generate these ocean waves. Certainly if an earthquake occurs in the middle of a continent, uh, there's no ocean there for a tsunami. And tsunami can have many sources, uh, one of which is earthquakes, but there are, are others, and I will get into that. The uh, objective today is to give you a uh, introduction to these two topics and a little information uh, regarding how they relate to us here in, in uh, Florida. Well, this next slide uh, gives you an idea of where we are headed over the next 45 to maybe 50 minutes. I think a little over half of this will be earthquakes, a little bit less than half will be tsunami. Starting out with earthquakes, I'll give you some background information. I may have used the term crustal plates uh, already. I will make sure you know what a crustal plate is uh, because it's the slipping of these crustal plates that causes the earthquake. We'll talk about where on Earth the earthquakes occur, earthquake regions. Uh, we'll give you some examples of the big ones. There are little ones occurring all the time, but the big ones are the ones that get into the papers and on the news. I'll give you some examples of those. And I'll then end that part of the talk with a, uh, uh, a, a section on uh, are there earthquakes in Florida. That will be a very quick section because the number of significant earthquakes in Florida over the last 50 years perhaps can be counted on the fingers of one hand. We are not an earthquake prone area. When it comes to tsunami, again, I'll start with the causes and we'll look at where they occur, where are the, the tsunami prone or tsunami common coasts. I'll give you some examples and then again, I'll wrap that up with uh, the uh, tsunami uh, tsunami situation that we have in, 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 in Florida. And to, uh, to tip my hand here, uh, again, as is the case with earth earthquakes, uh, we have very, very few tsunami in Florida. We're not a tsunami prone area uh, any more than we are an earthquake prone area. Then there'll be a wrap up. Okay, earthquakes, first of all, uh, are a, a sudden uh, slipping of Earth's crustal plates. And again, I haven't talked about what the crustal plates are, but I will in just a moment. They are caused when two adjacent crustal plates slip relative to each other. Commonly, two crustal plates will, uh, will uh, be moving in different directions and there will be a strain or a stress that, it, that is built up. And when finally the rocks give way, the crust gives way, then there's a snapping response, and that is the earthquake. They are highly variable in magnitude. I mentioned that the, the earthquakes we hear about are the big ones, uh, but they're going on uh, in many, many locations uh, regularly. Depending on how big they are, uh, effects uh, will include damage to structures. Some will just rattle the plates in the kitchen cupboard. Others will bring down buildings. Uh, if the soil is saturated uh, and there's a shaking of the Earth's crust, that can produce a, a, a landslide. And then finally, in some cases, in coastal areas, for example, uh, or in the open ocean, uh, there can be, as a result of an earthquake, a tsunami. I have down here at the bottom of the slide uh, the term tumblers. 
Uh, we commonly in this part of the world or in this part of the country talk about earthquakes as earthquakes. That's the word we use. Elsewhere, apparently, tumblers uh, is a more common expression. If you hear or you read the word tumblers, uh, you can translate it to earthquakes. The two terms can be used interchangeably. To understand crustal plates and the source of earthquakes, uh, we have to take a, a quick uh, step back and review the interior of the Earth. You may have had this in an Earth science course, or you may be getting this in an Earth science course, uh, or you may be hearing it for the first time here. It doesn't matter. Uh, I have grayed out uh, the, uh, the, the core, inner and outer. There is, that is the innermost part of the Earth. But we don't have to be worried about that for earthquakes. But up in the mantle, uh, just outside uh, the outer core, uh, that is a, a fluid part of the Earth's interior. The molten rock, which is called magma, can move. It moves very, very slowly, it moves over geological time scales. Continuing out then, we get to the asthenosphere. And that can be plastic, which is not quite liquid, but not quite solid. It can deform very slowly. And then finally, there is the, the Earth's crust, which is where we are. It's the outermost part of the Earth. And this insert up here shows that Earth's crust can be divided generally into two types. And I think that is the next slide. Uh, so I won't go into that here. Uh, two types of crust, yes. Uh, there is continental crust, uh, commonly granite. Two characteristics there. Uh, the continental crust is relatively thick. More important for our purposes, uh, it is relatively light. It is relatively uh, low density. Oceanic crust is the other type of crust. In contrast with the continental crust, then it, uh, uh, it is relatively thin. And again, more importantly for us, it is relatively dense. It's more important because there are parts of the world where these two crusts come together, and we will see that logically the more dense crust, the oceanic crust, because it's heavier, burrows down under the continental crust. And it's that process, that's the first step in the process that produces an earthquake. So we've got granite, we've got, we've got basalt, two types of crust. Uh, now, crustal plates, I've mentioned that a couple of times, and it is uh, it is time to tell you exactly what I'm talking about. Uh, Earth's crust is solid, however, it's cracked. The analogy that I use is the cracked eggshell, pretty good analogy. Uh, the crustal plate would be all of the area inside, inside of a crack, inside of a cracked eggshell, or for us, inside uh, the, the, uh, the cracks of the Earth's crust. And there are a bunch of these uh, crusts, uh, crustal plates, various sizes, uh, some really quite large. I think the one we are on, the North American plate, is the largest crustal plate. We share that with the, ex uh, the extreme eastern part of Russia, uh, all of Canada, all of Mexico, and Greenland in the upper right. There are various other uh, crustal plates, uh, some of which we won't be talking about today, uh, one of which, however, we will. And so just let me call, it in, call your attention to this yellow, very large yellow Pacific plate, which goes around just about the entire Pacific Ocean. I'll be coming back to that, uh, especially uh, when we show where the earthquakes occur. So we've got 15 major crustal plates. I'm not sure how large a plate has to be before it's considered major, but by whatever the definition is, there are 15 of those, and you see them here. I've got another version of that. Uh, again, you can see the, the cracks that define the crustal plates, but also here the red arrows are very helpful uh, in, in making the point that these crustal plates are moving, some moving a little faster, some a little slower, some moving in one direction, some moving in another direction. Uh, but the red arrows here, uh, I think, make the, make the point that the crustal plates are, are not static. They, uh, they are, are in motion. 
Uh, by the uh, just parenthetically here, uh, the uh, term used to be uh, uh, continental drift. It's not just the continents that are moving around. Uh, the oceanic crust is moving too. And so rather than talking about continental drift and, and really referring to only part of the story, now the term uh, that we use is plate tectonics. And tectonics is a word that you might not be familiar with or use very often, but tectonics is just the, the study of Earth's crust and the forces that change it, and specifically the forces that move it. So at the heart of the earthquake issue is moving tectonic plates. Then the question is, what makes crustal plates move? Uh, and we, again, we have to go back to the reason why we had to start with the cross section of the Earth uh, is because uh, that's where this process begins. There is heat escaping uh, from the interior of the Earth, and it does not escape everywhere uniformly. There are some preferred regions. Where heat is escaping, it is heating up the molten rock, the magma, and making it a little bit less dense. The magma then, because it is less dense, I've got an arrow pointing up here showing where uh, some uh, region of, of rising magma, heated magma, less dense magma. Uh, where it rises up, uh, it is coming up out of the, uh, the outer core, headed toward the asthenosphere or the crust. Because of the upward force of this magma, uh, this will raise the Earth's crust uh, just a little bit. Something's coming up from below. The crust above it is, uh, is raised. I'll be coming back to that. But when the magma gets up close to the asthenosphere, it spreads out. Now, now we had it coming up uh, in, in the previous slide. It's spreading out to the right and to the left, cooling as it goes. And as it cools, it becomes more dense. And finally, it becomes so dense, so heavy, that it sinks back down uh, into the mantle over here on the left and over here on the right. And if you put all of this together, uh, the rising magma, the heated rising magma, the spreading out, the sinking, and then it comes back to start over again over extremely long time scales. What you get is referred to as a mantle convection cell. And there's one going counterclockwise here and one going clockwise here. Okay, and now if a, if a crustal plate is on top of one of these cells, it will be carried along by the cell. I've got an animation uh, which I think is kind of nice. I don't have the web address for this. I probably should have included that. Uh, but what you can see here is the core and the heat escaping, the, uh, the, the rising up or the upwelling of magma uh, as, uh, as it is heated, as the density decreases. It's going up and it's spreading out. So what we can see then here are those two convection cells. Now, there are two processes associated with these, uh, these uh, mantle con uh, convection cells. I mentioned that when the, uh, the magma comes up, it raises the Earth's crust over it. And we can see a slight rise of the Earth's crust here. Gravity acts on that, and just as anything would slide downhill away from the, uh, the uh, ridge, in this case, or away from the high point, we have crust that is moving downhill to the right and downhill to the left. So that's one way in which crust can move. And I believe my next slide is called slab pull. Uh, this is the slab of Earth's crust, one over on the left, one on the right. Remember that as this crust is cooling, it is becoming more dense. And finally, it is dense enough, heavy enough, so that it sinks back down into the mantle. Of course, the crust is attached to the crust that is trailing behind it. And this heavy magma descending back into the mantle pulls the oceanic crust along with it. And so it's logically called slab pull. So we've got this ridge push uh, pushing the uh, 
the oceanic crust away from the ridge, and then we've got the slab pull, and the two are working together to make the crust move. There are three kinds of movement, uh, only one of which we really have to worry about, uh, but I'll go through all three of them. First of all, over in the upper left, uh, when two crustal plates are moving away from each other, they're spreading boundaries, that's called an, ex uh, an extensional boundary. This is the same as the ridge push that I was talking about two or three slides ago. I'll mention that just in passing because we can get earthquakes from that, but no tsunami. And the second then is uh, when two crustal plates are side by side uh, and they move uh, along each other, relative to each other, back and forth, as you see here, or as you see here, this is the San Andreas Fault. Uh, that's called a transform boundary. It's not spreading apart, it's not coming together, they're just moving along each other. Again, you can get earthquakes from that, but no tsunami. And the example is the San Andreas Fault over here on the right. So we've got two processes that don't produce tsunami. The third one then has to be the one that produces tsunami. Uh, you remember the slab pull process about two or three slides ago now where two plates are coming together. One is the oceanic crust, which is a little heavier. It's meeting the continental crust, which is a little bit lighter. In this case, the oceanic crust would be the one on the left. And because it is heavier, it's going to dive down, burrow down under the continental crust. This process, I don't think I have mentioned the word subduction, uh, but that uh, this process is called subduction, and the region where it's happening is the subduction zone. Now these two plates are coming together, so it's a compressional boundary. They're compressing. Uh, an example, um, the India and the Burma plates, I'll, we'll be coming back to that definitely when we talk about tsunami, because this kind of earthquake produced a major tsunami uh, maybe 15 or 20 years ago, so we will be coming back to that. Uh, but the third type, which is the one we need to worry about for linking earthquakes and tsunami, is this compressional boundary. Where, you might ask, do earthquakes occur? If you look at this uh, figure very, very closely, you can see what might look like a line, uh, a red line, is actually a series of many, many red dots. Each red dot uh, shows where an earthquake occurred. I think this is from 1950 up to the present or so, about the last 70 years. And you can see there are definitely preferred parts of the world uh, for earthquakes, and there are other parts of the world where you, they just don't happen. Uh, what immediately catches your eye, if only because I've drawn an ellipse around it, is the region of, of very frequent earthquake occurrences around the Pacific Ocean. And this, uh, th this ring of, of uh, earthquakes is referred to as the Circum-Pacific Belt. It's also known as the Ring of Fire. Uh, that's the, one, uh, the, uh, the name that will appear. It's kind of a catchy name, so that's what you might hear in the news. Uh, more commonly. As far as we are concerned, we in the United States, uh, most of our earthquakes are occurring along our west coast, which is part of this ring of fire. I think I mentioned once or twice for, uh, for both earth earthquakes and tsunami the fact that earthquakes can vary widely in, uh, in magnitude, in the amount of energy that's involved. Same as, uh, same as the case with tsunami, I'll be coming back to that. Often, I think still most commonly, when we are quantifying how powerful an earthquake is, we use the Richter scale. And the Richter scale is just a, a, a measure of how much energy is released when the earthquake occurs. Uh, there are nine uh, categories, nine, nine magnitudes uh, for the Richter scale. Uh, the magnitude one, two, and three can be picked up by an instrumentation, uh, by an instrument, a seismograph. Uh, we would probably not notice it. Maybe a three you would, but the one and two, uh, not so much. Uh, they may not be noticed. But when we get up into uh, magnitude four, 
uh, there can be some damage, maybe buildings that were about ready to fall over anyway. Uh, five, and now that's affecting a lot of buildings. Six and seven are serious. These make it onto the evening news. Eight does major damage, and I will show you an example of an earthquake. Uh, I believe it uh, is 9.2, uh, which happened like 15 years ago or so, but that was simply catastrophic. Um, you know, just to, uh, to uh, get a feeling for the Richter scale, I, I, I just might draw the parallel here that when we talk about hurricanes, uh, commonly we'll say category one, two, three, four, five to indicate how strong, how powerful the hurricane is. For earthquakes, we do this, we have the same approach with the Richter scale, the one, two, three, four, five, but here up to nine will give us a measure of how powerful that, that earthquake was. Uh, there is another um, way to quantify earthquakes, uh, which I will not get into, I'll just mention it. Uh, the moment magnitude scale. Apparently this one is better for the really powerful earthquakes. And so you might see re uh, reference to both scales if it's up around, uh, if it's a uh, Richter scale eight or nine, they might give you the moment magnitude scale equivalent. Otherwise you probably won't hear about that one very much. For us, a nearby big one uh, happened uh, very early this year. Uh, in January, again the magnitudes, and there were two of them, uh, magnitudes uh, 5.8 was I believe the, the first of the two that might be on the screen, a little hard to read, uh, and then there was one the following day, but they consider that to be part of, this, part of the same uh, earthquake event. Uh, this was in uh, Puerto Rico, just to remind you, uh, this uh, is on one of those uh, uh, boundaries between crustal plates and Puerto Rico again expanded down here. The earthquakes were on the south or off the south coast uh, in, the, uh, in the ocean in the uh, Caribbean Sea. And in the lower left then you can see uh, where the two earthquakes uh, occurred. It's my understanding that they did not issue a tsunami uh, alert with the first one. Uh, with the second one there was immediately issued a tsunami alert. Uh, but there was no tsunami associated with that, as it turned out. False alarm, but of course it's always better uh, to, be, uh, to be warned uh, and maybe take evasive action and then not have anything happen. Now this is a, um, uh, if I were giving this to a live audience, uh, I would be clicking on the, uh, the web address up there uh, and I would get a map that looks something like we see here. This map was the, the current map when I made this slide. Uh, you can see dots, and they will tell you uh, where the earth, earthquakes occurred. The dots are color-coded. Uh, here is a red one, which means that at the time I made this slide, there had been an earthquake there within the last hour. Uh, and you don't see very many red dots because there, there aren't earthquakes occurring all the time, so trying to catch one within the last hour is hard to do. But in the last day, uh, if you're going to look over that time frame, uh, then there should be many, uh, many, uh, uh, many dots. So the, the gold dots are earthquakes within the last day, red are within the last hour, and the size of the dot uh, will tell you the magnitude of, of that earthquake. Whenever you're watching this, uh, you see this slide, you get the web address, maybe as a class exercise or as a homework exercise, uh, you might go to your computer, click on it, and see, see, see what you get. Uh, you might, might, be, uh, might be able to get a red dot in there someplace, a couple red dots, you never know. It's a roll of the dice. You might get a lot of small dots indicating just a lot of small magnitude earthquakes, or you might get a big one. Uh, you just never know until you do it. Focusing on the United States, and I have sort of... Um, prepped you for this. I've mentioned the San Andreas Fault a couple of times. Uh, here you can see it coming through California, right on the coast in central and northern California, and then inland further to the south. Again, just recalling what we've talked about before, uh, this is a transform boundary. We've got two plates that are moving past each other, not spreading apart, not coming uh, together. 
Uh, the east side of this boundary is moving slowly to the southeast, and the west side of the boundary is moving to the northwest. And over long time scales, then, something or someone down here on the east side uh, that had a neighbor uh, directly across the boundary, uh, they, they will have moved, and they will no longer be neighbors, and instead they will both have uh, new neighbors, depending on who has moved in or who has moved out. And I think I mentioned uh, this is our part of the Ring of Fire or the, uh, the, the Circum-Pacific Belt. A couple of examples, the big ones, and to get big ones, I have to go back, uh, I have to go quite far back in time. Uh, the San Francisco earthquake of 1906, the estimates are that the magnitudes, uh, uh, the, the, the magnitude was somewhere in the high sevens or low eights. I don't think there was instrumentation at that time, so they can't be sure. Sometimes you can estimate the power of an earthquake by the amount of destruction, but back in those days, uh, the building codes were sort of loose. They probably knew they were in an earthquake prone area, but they didn't have regulations for uh, for buildings, and so buildings toppled over a little more easily than they do now. So it, it's, it's uh, difficult to estimate the magnitude, but they're thinking it was right around 8.0, which is uh, very respectable. More recently, 1989, and I think it was during a baseball game in Oakland uh, that there was uh, another earthquake, magnitude 7. Uh, and the lights went out, uh, the television signal was interrupted, and that was sort of the end of the game. But a lot of people watching that game, uh, just for an instant there, became sort of a part of, of history because here was uh, an earthquake and the, uh, the effects of that earth earthquake uh, were uh, being broadcast uh, right, in, right into your living room. Florida, uh, well, uh, not so much, really. Uh, I was able to come up with a couple of examples uh, along the Florida-Alabama line. Uh, one in 1952, the uh, red dot here. Uh, Quincy is very close to Tallahassee, I believe. And I'm sure there is a number, uh, the, a magnitude number for this, but uh, the reference I came up with uh, just described it as a slight tremor, so it might be down in like the three or the four category. Uh, more recently, uh, in the Gulf of Mexico, the blue dot, and I guess that qualifies as a, a Florida earthquake, uh, that was respectable, uh, magnitude 5.8. I do not believe there was a tsunami associated with that, although it was uh, a respectable earthquake. And then, uh, just uh, more recently in uh, I think this was uh, in early September of 2020 on the Florida-Alabama line, uh, color-coded green. Uh, there was a, uh, an earthquake which was magnitude 3.8. But that doesn't mean that we don't feel a little more shaking here. Even if the earthquake was not centered on or around close to uh, Florida, Sometimes if it's even further away, if it's large enough, we can feel the effects here. And there was a uh, late January 2020 earthquake in the Caribbean. You can see it's sort of equidistant between uh, the Cayman Islands, Jamaica, and the east end of Cuba. Uh, magnitude 7.7, .7, but that was large enough so that there was shaking felt in Miami. So it was not here but close enough so that we were uh, certainly aware of it. And unless I am mistaken, we are going to move now into the tsunami part of the talk. Once again, uh, the definition is that these are very long ocean waves. The wavelength from one crest to the next might be several tens of kilometers. Out over the open ocean, because it is uh, so far from one crest, the high water, to the trough, low water, and back to the next crest, because it's so far, as this wave moves through, you're going up and down. If you're on a ship or in a boat, you're going up and down, maybe a meter or so, over a time scale of many, many minutes, maybe even a couple of hours. 
So you're not aware of it, but as the tsunami, as the wave approaches a coast, it slows down and it compresses because what's coming in isn't in the shallow water yet, so it's moving faster and catching up with what is closer to the coast. And as it compresses in the horizontal, it must build in the vertical, so these tsunami can become quite destructive close to the coast. Several causes, and again, I've grayed out uh, most of them. We don't have to worry here. I'm trying to tie in earthquakes and tsunami wherever possible. Uh, volcanoes can, can, can cause a tsunami. Landslides into the ocean uh, can. Uh, meteorological disturbance. Asteroids, we don't have very many asteroids anymore. Uh, they can all produce tsunami, but the one uh, that uh, maybe is most common, uh, but certainly uh, the one that is most relevant today is the, uh, or are the tsunamis that are, are associated with shallow earthquakes. Again, the effects of a tsunami will just be right along the coast, of course, uh, and the magnitude of the effect depends upon the magnitude of the tsunami. It can be either very, very small or, uh, or very, very large, catastrophic. And again, I almost forgot uh, that there is an alternate name, uh, just as earthquakes can sometimes be referred to as tumblers, uh, tsunamis can sometimes be referred to as seismic sea waves. It's more of a technical term, I guess. The word tsunami itself is a Japanese term, but it's used around the world uh, quite commonly. Uh, let's not equate uh, tsunami with tidal waves. Sometimes people will use the term tidal waves, referring to a wall of water crashing onto the coast. That's a tsunami, but it's not a tidal wave. Tidal waves are the rise and fall of the tide, the ebb and flood of the tide that occurs along many coasts uh, twice a day. It's a perfectly normal thing. Don't worry about tidal waves worry about tsunami, and let's not uh, uh, confuse the issue. If there's a tsunami coming, don't call it a tidal wave because we don't evacuate from the coast for a tidal wave. Now, uh, just as an aside here, if you Google tsunami, uh, you might uh, get a variety of, 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 uh, of hits. Uh, this is a real tsunami, and I believe this was the first picture that I had on the uh, the uh, title slide. The other two are not, however. In the upper left is a, a breaking tidal wave. In some cases, when tides move into an estuary, uh, the tidal wave, the high tide, the tidal crest can become unstable and break, just like a wind wave breaks when it hits the coast. That's called a tidal bore. And uh, it might, you might think that's a tsunami, but it's not. Uh, that it's a, a uh, destructive uh, wave. You would not want to be in the path of that in a boat, uh, but it's, it's not a, a tsunami. And then uh, artists go crazy. Uh, this, uh, I could have put a number of pictures in here. You, you can see just off to the right here in the background, this huge wave coming up onto the coast. Um, I don't think tsunami get well, maybe with a few exceptions over the, over the decades, uh, you might find a tsunami like that moving up into, a, uh, into an estuary where it's, it's being more and more constricted in the horizontal. It becomes larger in the vertical and takes on a, a shape like that. But normally, uh, there, you, you can see a big difference uh, between the tsunami that the artist created in the lower left and the tsunami that actually occurred off the coast, along the coast of Japan. Uh, in 20, uh, 2011. I've got two or three slides, I think, uh, frequently asked questions, FAQs. Uh, it is common for, uh, for tsunami approaching a coast to start out with a drawdown of water and exposing ocean floor. And that would be the, uh, the case if the, if the trough of the tsunami wave arrives first. Maybe that happens most of the time, or maybe not necessarily. Uh, that would be a drawdown, and that's, if you have to be somewhere uh, that will be impacted by a tsunami, that's what you want, because this drawdown and the exposure, the temporary exposure of ocean bottom tells you there's a problem coming here. And in this case, uh, you see the drawdown, and you can see the tsunami uh, coming in uh, from the coast. 
I don't know, uh, actually I don't know how this picture was taken because probably within about a minute or so this uh, tsunami hit the coast and there was a lot of destruction. I think for these three swimmers uh, this uh, story has, uh, has a very unhappy ending. Now this is if you get the drawdown first and you've got some warning. The other case, and I'll show you an example of that, uh, would be where the crest of the tsunami arrives first. You get the high water coming in first. In that case, you've got no warning. Uh, you just get this, and you, you might be able to see it coming in, uh, but, uh, but you didn't have the, uh, the drawdown to alert you that there is a, uh, is a problem. Uh, the tsunami uh, waves, I should refer to it as waves, because uh, there can be several uh, crests and troughs and crests and troughs coming in. Uh, they can be spaced apart. They can be coming in quite, uh, quite uh, uh, closely one after the other, several minutes uh, between the, the, the crests or perhaps as much as an hour apart. Uh, I think I mentioned that in the open ocean uh, the tsunami are usually uh, undetectable unless you have instrumentation that is able to sense it. Uh, but it's when it gets to the coast uh, that the, the amplitude of the tsunami increases and it becomes very destructive. Frequently asked tsunami question number two, how fast do these things go? Well, it depends upon the water depth. Uh, in, an, in an average depth out of, in the open ocean, average depth, which is about 3,800 meters or so, it would be cruising along at about 720 kilometers per hour, translates into 450 miles per hour. Just to give you a feeling for that, it just happens that from Jacksonville down to Marathon, it's uh, about 450 miles. So if a tsunami, this is very uh, hypothetical, very iffy, but if a tsunami were to start up here and move through water of, of uh, average ocean depth, uh, it would get down to Marathon in about an hour. You'd have that much warning. And I mentioned that tsunami move more slowly in shallow water. Uh, frequently asked question number three, uh, where do they occur? Uh, now, uh, you remember for earthquakes, uh, there's the ring of fire around the Pacific Ocean. Uh, this map is not so good for showing Pacific Ocean because you've got half of it on the far right and the other half on the far left. But you can see that uh, the, the tsunami risk, uh, because it is orange, uh, high risk, uh, tsunami risk is greatest here in Eastern Asia and Western North, North America. But there are, are high risk areas elsewhere uh, we have, uh, there, there can be 25%, a quarter of the recorded uh, tsunami in the Mediterranean Sea. And most of them, I guess, would be in the Pacific or in the Mediterranean, there are only 12% for the Atlantic Ocean. And we will see in just a little while, there are large uh, stretches of coastline on the Atlantic Ocean where uh, there, there have not been recorded uh, tsunami. And 4% uh, in the Indian Ocean over here. But I will show you in just a couple slides one of the notable exceptions uh, was just a, uh, uh, a huge earthquake that produced an equally huge tsunami uh, in the Indian Ocean. So they may be very few and far between there, but they can be big ones when they occur. Now, the tsunami producing earthquake, how does it go? Uh, we have uh, talked about compressional boundaries. I'm just a reminder, I have a reminder in the upper left part of the screen and th where continental plates meet oceanic plates and this is called subduction in a subduction zone. And here uh, we see a, a, a subduction zone, a region that has oceanic crust a little bit heavier basalt, a little bit heavier, three to three and a half grams per cubic centimeter, coming in from the left. It's meeting continental crust on the, on the right. Continental crust is just a little bit lighter, so logically the heavier crust would burrow down under the, uh, under the lighter crust. So that is the, 
the setup. The, uh, the movement of these two, one, uh, uh, one against the other, uh, is, uh, is erratic. They might hang up for a while. So as the oceanic crust continues to burrow down, it's going to take the continental crust down with it for a while. And then the strain builds up. The continental crust then finally lets go and snaps back up. And if there happens to be ocean above the continental crust when it snaps up, the ocean will be lifted up. And that, is, that becomes the crest of the tsunami wave. Now, I'm mentioning all of this in some detail here. Uh, we've got the overriding crust here. The con overriding continental crust is bent downward, and the strain builds, and then it snaps up. Uh, now, in this case, I'm going to give you the website. We're going to go to the website. But we can see the oceanic crust coming in. If you look carefully, you can see the continental crust being bent down. And at some point, it is going to snap back up. And here's the crest of the wave. That's the tsunami going in both directions. And part of it then crashes onto the coast. And at this point, I think we get an advertisement. Now, the Indian Ocean example. Remember that the Indian Ocean gets about 4%. Uh, statistically, it gets 4% of the tsunami, or 4% of the earthquake. It's not an, uh, earthquakes. It's not an earthquake-prone area. But this was a big one. Uh, you can see over on the left there, the, uh, the, the earthquake had a magnitude of 9.1, catastrophic. Who knows what would have happened if the earthquake had occurred over land. In this case, it occurred over water, and it generated a tsunami. Uh, in the previous slide, we saw the uh, tsunami wave going both to the left and to the right. That's what happened here. So the next slide, I believe, will be an animation. And we will see a tsunami wave moving from right to left. And we'll see it hitting the, uh, uh, the east coast of India. And then there's not much room here before, uh, before it hits the, uh, the, uh, the coast of Sumatra. But we'll see the other tsunami wave going the other direction. Now, this one will play over and over again, so I don't have to try to uh, race it to conclusion. But you can see one uh, tsunami wave going toward the left, one going toward the right. These are color-coded, where you see the red. That's high water. Where you see the blue, it is low water. And you can see that the westward moving tsunami had the wave crest, had the high water leading the low water. If you look very carefully when this restarts, uh, the, the one that goes to the right, the blue water leads the, uh, the, the blue uh, pattern, the, the uh, low water leads the high water. So for people along this coast, the low water came first. There was a drawdown. And then the tsunami high water came ashore. They had some warning. On the other hand, along coast of Sri Lanka or the Indian Ocean east coast of India. The high water appeared first. Uh, there was really no warning. And actually, in that part of the world, uh, even if they had warning by radio, uh, just your ordinary transistor radio, uh, I, I don't, don't know how effective that would have been. And I suspect that most people there were uh, definitely caught off guard. So we've got this animation for uh, this part of the Indian Ocean. Next slide is not an animation, but uh, no, we were looking up here at this part of the Indian Ocean. If we take a bigger picture, we can see how this tsunami wave spread out over the entire Indian Ocean and down into the, uh, into the Southern Ocean. This is the coast of Antarctica down here. Uh, if you can read these small numbers here, that's the number of hours it took for the tsunami to get to that point. Uh, it took three hours for the tsunami to get anywhere along this black line. And you can see it took three, four, five, six, seven hours, eight hours to get over to the island of Madagascar. This is Africa. And depending on what part of the east coast of Africa you're concerned with, you can see this would take uh, anywhere from seven to eight to nine to 10 to 11 to 12 hours to, uh, to hit that part of the, of the uh, 
coast. Uh, you can calculate just from how far, how, uh, far apart these lines are uh, that the wave speed was somewhere around 650 to 700 uh, kilometers per hour. So I guess the good news is they had up to 10 or 11 hours to get ready for the tsunami. Of course, along the coast of Africa, with this tsunami wave spreading out, uh, it probably wasn't, uh, wasn't very big along, uh, along some of these uh, stretches of coastline. In the Americas, uh, we do get tsunami here, uh, depending on where you are. Uh, we might immediately look to Florida, and I, this is, uh, I don't know if this is the last 50 years or so, uh, but you can notice the entire coast of Florida, uh, the Atlantic side, the Gulf side, peninsula, panhandle, we have no recorded tsunami uh, events. In fact, for the entire Gulf of Mexico, uh, no tsunami have been recorded. Around the Caribbean, uh, however, they definitely have had tsunami, and we saw an uh, example, uh, actually we'll see an example of that in the next slide. And then with uh, the west coast of North America, the west coast of South America, again, that's part of the ring of fire, a lot of earthquakes, and even if not all earthquakes generate tsunami. If you've got a lot of earthquakes, you're going to have a relatively large number of tsunami as well. So they're happening around us uh, infrequently, I guess, uh, but they're not happening, happening here. We have other things to worry about, of course. Now, tsunami in our past, uh, again, Florida is, is clear. We don't have any examples. Uh, the two examples that I could come up with are two of the, of the 10 that have been recorded, both after instrumentation uh, became available and before. Estimates for before instrumentation was available might be kind of iffy, but, uh, uh, but uh, this is what, uh, what we have. We've got one from Puerto Rico that was 1918. Certainly plenty of people in uh, Puerto Rico at that time, but no instrumentation. Uh, killed over 100 uh, people. And as best they can estimate, I'm sure that magnitude 7.3 uh, is an estimate. Uh, it was just over magnitude 7. And the other one, more recently, just after World War II, I guess, uh, in the Dominican Republic, which is in the, the east side of the island of Hispaniola, magnitude 8.1. Uh, that's a major uh, earthquake and killed 1,800 people uh, in 1946. I, do, I don't know the fraction of the population at that time, but I think it would have been uh, substantial. Okay, well, that's the best I can do for tsunami in our past. Tsunami in the future, uh, this is very iffy. Maybe 15 years ago or so, somebody noted that in the eastern North Atlantic, in the Canary Islands, on the island of La Palma, which is the westernmost island there. There was a mountain, Cumbre Vieja, a volcano, and it had a very steep slope, and it was th thought that if that slope became saturated with water and sort of was like a quasi-mud, and then there was any triggering mechanism at all, some of that mud might slide down into the ocean, displacing water, and creating a tsunami. And it was played up in the news for about two days or so, and then the news people uh, moved on to other things. But I, that's about the only example of a threat that we have here. It's a, a minimal threat, and I think if we apply a little logic or common sense here, here are the Canary Islands, uh, and the mudslide might be occurring here. There's no law that says all of that tsunami would be coming in our direction. It would be spreading out all over the North and South Atlantic. I guess I've just got the North Atlantic here. But we would, we would get just a small fraction of that, of that wave. And so uh, the fact that we would get a very small tsunami out of this and the fact that it takes about nine hours to cross the Atlantic Ocean means we should have plenty of uh, warning uh, should that occur in the unlikely event that that ever occurs. However, uh, you might not be in Florida all the time, and if you are someplace where there is a tsunami uh, warning, some more uh, tsunami-prone area, 
uh, th there may be horns going off uh, uh, to warn you of that. Here, by the way, I believe it's the FPNL uh, nuclear power plant uh, that will uh, blow their horns. They would do that for uh, for a nuclear uh, event, disaster. Uh, they will also do that for a, uh, a tsunami. Uh, the, war the warning time uh, depends. Uh, if it's something moving across from the Canary Islands, uh, you'd have hours to get uh, uh, to get uh, out of the way. Otherwise, you might have substantially less time than that. But however much time you have, you've got a choice. Uh, you can either get out of the way or you can go down to the beach to watch. Uh, that's your call, of course. Uh, but uh, the take-home message here for this part of the talk, and my advice to you is that if uh, you're on the beach and you hear the warning uh, go off, uh, it could be a tsunami, it could be a nuclear disaster, <laughs> doesn't matter. Uh, you, should, uh, you should get off the beach and then you can catch it on the evening news. Okay, this is the two minute wrap up and uh, you might recall that, uh, and I've got this two way arrow up here uh, with a question mark, meaning that do earthquakes produce tsunami? Well, do tsunami come from earthquakes? And the answer to that question is, well, sometimes, yes, they do, but most of the time, no, they don't. And examples uh, would be asteroids. We haven't had one in a long time, but that can produce a tsunami. It has nothing to do with an earthquake. Landslides, uh, such as uh, La Vieja Cumbre uh, in the Canary Islands, that could produce a tsunami, no doubt about that, uh, but it has nothing to do with earthquakes and similarly volcanoes uh, exploding either along the coast or underwater uh, could produce tsunami, but it has nothing to do with an earthquake. However, beginning with the hot interior of the earth, and as we've seen, uh, that can lead to these convection cells in the mantle, convection cells of magma, uh, that, that, through either the ridge push or the slab pull, that can produce a movement of crustal plates, plate tectonics. Depending on the response to that, where it is, where you are, where, uh, where it's happening, that can produce a transform fault, which can produce an earthquake, but there's no tsunami associated with that. It can produce an extensional fault, such as in the mid-Atlantic Ridge. That can produce an earthquake, but there's no tsunami associated with that. So it has to be the red arrow down here, where we get a compressional fault for example, oceanic crust meeting continental crust and the heavier oceanic crust goes below the continental crust and takes the continental crust down with it, creating strain and stress until it finally lets go, snaps back. That would be subduction. There's an earthquake associated with that snapback. And if this is happening at the coast and there's water above that crust that is suddenly snapping up, that would produce a tsunami. And I believe this is where I will stop.